before you lead your family, you lead your team at work, you lead an organization, you have to learn how to handle and lead yourself. Welcome, everybody. This is the Living Life Juicy channel. I'm John Losey, your host and guide through this as we explore how can we be present and kind as we go about doing great things. Today, uh, I have the pleasure to sit down and talk with Dan Cockrell. Now, Dan worked his way up through the Disney organization, starting with the Disney World College program in 1989. He went over to Disney Paris, worked there in uh, different levels of management, worked his way all the way up to VP Magic Kingdom until he retired last year um, in his desire to share insights and experiences as a coach and consultant. So Dan has worked in many different levels in large organizations, and he's also now traveling around talking with many different organizations. So I would really love to tap into his uh, insights and thoughts around leadership at different levels in different organizations. So welcome, Dan. So glad you could join me today. Thanks, John. I really enjoy these podcasts and talking to people. And I, I think I learn as much as everyone listening when I get to talk about this. So thank you for having me. Yeah, we've had the opportunity to chat a few times leading up to this in your, uh, your adventures in Paris and being with your family and now hopping all over the place. But tell me a little bit more. What's going on in your world right now? Well, it's been uh, May. This past May of 2019 was a year uh, since I left Disney. And the past year has been a whirlwind. Uh, you know, I have, although I have 26 years of experience at Disney, I had zero years of experience as an entrepreneur. So I've, I've kind of, uh, I guess I would call myself the Phoenix. It's kind of rebirth. And I'm learning every single day about running a company and talking to people and uh, invoicing and uh, getting leads and creating content. And it's just been uh, I think retired is a very loose term for what I'm doing because I feel like I'm working more than I ever have, but it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. It's very exciting. Yeah, you retired from Disney, but now you're a, you're a rookie entrepreneur. Exactly. And, uh, you know, my, my, my thing over, I had 19 different jobs at Disney and I've always preached uh, multiple experience, diverse experiences is just super important. And uh, so this 20th job was a big move, but I think it was the same idea. Do something different and you just learn uh, things you'll never get exposed to when you change jobs and kind of change careers. Tell me a little bit about what you're, what, describe what you're doing right now. Yeah. So right now uh, uh, we, I mean, we have our, my, my wife and I are working closely together and she's helping me uh, with a lot of this. Uh, and, um, we got through the first two months of me leaving Disney and didn't kill each other. And we're still, we're still making our way. We've never spent so much time together in our 26 years of marriage. So that's been a good learning for us. But, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm doing keynote, uh, speeches for companies who are interested in hearing about leadership and hearing about creating an environment for employees and or organizations to, to set up environment for people. I'm doing some actually just pure consulting internationally with some hotel companies. Uh, I started a podcast. I'm, I've done about 30 episodes now. I do an, a, a monthly uh, news subscription newsletter I send out. I uh, just got a, a contract back uh, two days ago from a uh, publishing company. So my book is, I knocked that out last month. And uh, they're going to, um, we're putting together a plan to publish that and get that out. And uh, so, like I said, I got my, my fingers in lots of different pies to see what sticks and see what works. Yeah. I, I, and it's all a process kind of, uh, it sounds like it's a process of both reinventing yourself and discovering yourself. Yes. The way I think about it, I mean, I'm, I came from an organization that really focuses on leadership. It focuses on customer service. So I've, you know, I've had 26 years in, at Disney to learn this approach and learn a certain way to think about things, which is why I'm in this position today where I can go out and talk about that and it has some value to other organizations. And I think the other side of that is I am reinventing myself and I'm figuring out how to tell that story in my own way and with my own style and create my own brand along the way. So uh, a lot of it is just you know, this idea of continual learning. I'm talking to people all the time, people like you, uh, you know, some of these seminars I go to, talking to entrepreneurs, talking to people of just, there's uh there was this whole world out there that I was never exposed to, obviously working in a big corporation. And now that I'm out 
kind of connecting outside of Disney, it is just incredible. Uh, all the entrepreneurial activities that are happening in the world. Yeah, it seems like there's a never ending source of, of entrepreneurial ideas. And, and this is, I, I'm curious, I'm going to jump into a whole different thing. Eh? Sure. But what I'm finding, because I was in, in corporate for a long time, and then stepped out, and I'm finding that there's a lot of stuff out there, especially in the leadership and marketing and entrepreneurial stuff. There's stuff that sells, and there's stuff that works, and it's not necessarily the same stuff. Right, right. Yeah, it's, I was it's funny. I was talking about uh, to someone about this just a couple days ago, and we were discussing uh, just, you know, it, it, you can go out and, and find thousands of books on leadership. And, you know, to tell the truth, a lot of things that I go and talk about are in a lot of those books. You know, there's not a lot of really new concepts. Human nature doesn't change very much. And leadership is a lot about understanding human nature. And I think uh, it's the same reason there's a new diet that comes out every couple of years, because that is something that's so important in our lives. And when you can say to people that you have a new secret uh, to address something that's so important in our lives, people pay attention. And to your point, it's easy to market it, but to actually deliver it on the back end is the most important thing. So uh, the, the approach I've taken is, um, you know, try to, um, a lot of storytelling, first of all, because that's what we learned at Disney. When you tell stories, you connect to people emotionally. And when you connect to people emotionally, they're more likely to trust you, they're more likely to internalize what you're saying, and they're more likely to sustain that behavior. And, uh, and, and so I, I take that approach. And the other thing I'm, I've really learned it's important to do is not just talk about the motivational, inspirational part of what I talk, which I hope I can do, but also have people walk away with very specific tools, very specific tactics, very specific behaviors that they, they have something that they can actually start doing the next day if they've decided they wanna change something. And I think that's incredibly important because I've, you know, a friend of mine said, you know, Dan, I've been to a lot of keynote speeches and we all walk out pumped up, high-fiving each other about how excited we are. And then we get back on Monday and we go right back to what we were doing before and we don't change anything. So how do you give people an opportunity just to, they may not make the change, but if they clearly know what specific small change they can make to start that process, sometimes that's all they need. Yeah, I, I totally buy into your, that approach to things, which is, uh, there's so much stuff out there that people get amped about, but if it doesn't cause any kind of behavioral change, it's, it's almost wasted. I don't, I don't think it's wasted time and energy, but uh, it can be really expensive just to get continually amped up about things and never change. Right. And, and I think we see that in companies, right? People talk about the, the, you know, the flavor of the month. We come up with the new thing, we, uh, and we've done that at Disney. I think every company, and, and I, sometimes I do that personally. I dive into something. This is going to be it. And, you, you, you know, like everything, you start out strong, but then sustaining behaviors is that's what life's all about. How do you sustain whatever you're trying to get done? And uh, that takes discipline. It takes processes and systems. It takes a, a community to help you. I mean, there's a lot of ways to come at that. But at the end of the day, that's the thing I've just determined I can't make people do is change their mind. You know, I can give them all the information, but they have to make a decision that they want to do something differently. And that's where they have to kind of use their emotions to decide, why am I doing this? Am I doing it for myself? Am I doing it for my family? Am I doing it for my career so I can do better? You know, whatever that reason is. Yeah, I've been, <coughs> when um, I was working with executives on emotional intelligence, the big thing we discovered is that everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. That's nothing new. It's helping them discover what is it intrinsically that will get them uh, moving to change. And I cannot motivate anybody. It's all intrinsic. So if you can figure out what is that internal trigger that is important enough for them to change their behaviors, then the to-dos are pretty straightforward. Most people know what they're supposed to be doing when you talk about health. Everybody knows how they're supposed to live, what they're supposed to eat, all that kind of stuff. But there has to be an internal, something that's, that's crucial enough to that person to get them to overcome that uh, inertia of, of stillness to take the first few steps. Yes. And what I've, what I've found generally is I think often people will make a change due to crisis or education. That seems to be two main drivers. Uh, you know, the, the classic one where, 
okay, I have a blow up with one of my kids and you get into it and you find out, you know, this is not just a one-off. There's, there's something deeper here. And that crisis situation makes you reevaluate what kind of relationship you want to have with people or the day that, you know, you have trouble and maybe you have a, a heart issue or you have a health issue. That is a wake up call uh, to say, okay, this is a crisis. If I don't change, I'm not going to have the right quality of life. That's a big uh, motivator. And the other motivator is education. Once I start learning about what the impact of things have on me and educate myself, I'm more likely to respond. Um, I think that's why it's so powerful now and all these states are passing these laws that you have to have the calorie counts on menus, right? Because things you'd order before now, that catches my eye. You know, I go to Starbucks and I see that blueberry scone. That used to be like, hey, I'll have a snack. And now I look at it, I'm like, boy, that's like an hour of running. <laughs> like, <laughs> maybe I should reevaluate my decision. And it's simply because I, you know, they're helping, they're, they're putting laws in place to help people educate themselves. And that's just one example of many areas that we, we need to learn about. Yeah. I want to hear more about your, the importance of storytelling. You know, we, everybody hears about how Disney's all about the story. Tell me why is storytelling so important and how come, it, why is it so powerful? Yeah, well, I think it goes back, you know, thousands of years before the written word, before TV, before internet, before any of that. The only way that uh, communication was done and, and, and things were handed down generation to generation was through storytelling. And it's at the root of our sort of, once again, our emotional uh, beings. And so once again, it's, it's, it's a piece of human nature. It's something that people respond to. Uh, that when they hear a story, they can they remember the story. It, it sticks with them, and they're the right part of their brain for long-term memory. It connects with their emotional side of their brain, and it's it's much less likely to leave uh, than you know data. And so I think you know um, Walt Disney recognized that way early on. Uh, I don't I'm not sure if he studied ancient cultures or not, but he he started he he enjoyed storytelling, and I think as he did more of that he realized how much of a differentiator it could be in the businesses he was doing, whether it was animation or making full length movies and eventually building theme parks. And luckily I think the Disney organization has, um, you know, the, the, the fine line between what you should change to, to innovate and be relevant to people and what you shouldn't change is always a moving target. And we've seen many examples of companies that stayed the same and they're no longer in business. But I think at a, at a base level, um, Disney is in a lot of, you know, really great companies have realized that if they can touch their customers, touch their guests at an emotional level, uh, that that's going to, um, make it, I guess you call it sticky and they're more likely to come back. They're more likely to engage with the products. And, uh, so we still today, everything at Disney is a story. Every, every time something's built there, the story is explained to the, the engineers, the story is explained to the architects. Everyone understands what the story is, and that's why you create so much continuity when it, it, the finished product comes out. It just feels right because everyone kind of knew what the story was supposed to be, and people can recognize that. Um, I've heard uh, when I was talking to one of the Imagineers, they explained to me when I got to Magic Kingdom, they said, you know, there's not a whole bunch of uh, 15 or 10-year-old kids who know what the turn of the century Main Street USA is supposed to look like. Right. They just, you know, that, that, that's not something that they've experienced. It's probably not something they've read about. But when you go on Main Street USA at the Magic Kingdom or Disneyland or any of the parks around the world, it just feels right. Everything connects. Uh, everything makes sense. Nothing is out of place. Um, it's uh, all the details are taken care of because someone told a story and said, we're going to tell a story about optimism and positivity and it's going to radiate that. And that really stays with people. Um, so I, I've found that not only in, I think with our guests and our products, but that's uh, people respond to stories. Also, I can tell someone all day long about what they should be doing, or I can tell them a story about how it's impacting their kids, or I can tell a story about myself and maybe a failure I had and a story behind it. And just it, it, it people retain that. So I get it's story is so important in connecting with people and, and product and authenticity. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts about the importance of the story that you tell yourself. Yeah, so that's 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 great question. I, I love that question. Very uh, insightful. Um, so that I, I'm going to go off on a tangent here. Um, all my um, I when I left Disney, I remember I was gone for about a month or two, and one night I just sat down and said, "Okay, what do I know? I don't know what I know. 
I worked at Disney 26 years, but I, I'm not, I don't know if I know anything. So I just started writing things down. <laughs> and uh, at the end of the night, I had this huge list of uh, things and descriptions. And I gave it to a friend of mine who's a, a professor uh, at uh, Rollins College who runs the MBA program. And I said, Keenan, can you look at this and tell me what I have here? Because I'm just too close to it. And, and I thought he was going to do some, maybe some, I had some typos and he was going to rework some of the wording. He came back and said, you have three major themes here. You have a whole section on leading yourself, a whole section on leading your, uh, your team, and a whole section on leading your organization. And from that day forward, uh, that's how my website has been set up to kind of talk about what I do. It's how my speeches flow. It is how my book is set up that I wrote. Everything's set up around those three themes. When I, when I think about who I want to be and that uh, what's the story I tell myself, uh, that's all about how you lead yourself. And uh, I really believe is before you lead your family, you lead your team at work, you lead an organization, you have to learn how to handle and lead yourself. And uh, that includes a lot of things. It's uh, physical. It's your health. Do you know your numbers? It's things as simple as, you know, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your resting heart rate. Do you, um, do you go get your, if, uh, a mammogram? Do you get your colonoscopy after 50? You know, it's all the things that are just preventative in nature that we can kind of take stress out of our lives. There's hydration. There's diet. There's exercise. There's sleep. I think sleep is one of the most underrated activities that causes people stress, causes people um, not being able to be their maximum and be distracted. Then there's a whole piece on uh, your, um, and you, you mentioned emotional intelligence earlier, um, how you manage your, your feelings and your emotions and how you react to the world and how you, I, I, I've been I'm lately on this theme about do you react or do you respond? And that's kind of the, the, the subtle difference is reacting, you're less in control, responding, you choose what you're going to do. It doesn't mean you're not going to choose to be aggressive, but you're choosing to do that. Reacting is letting your sort of reptilian brain decide and what you're going to fight or flight response. So um, that's, and that's something that um, I, in my speeches, I, I did a very uh, in-depth uh, presentation a couple weeks ago on emotional intelligence for a group and really talked about, okay, now that we understand what it is, how do you start to become more self-aware, more empathetic, control your, uh, be more self-disciplined and learn how to respond correctly. And then uh, there's a couple other pieces. Time management is another one that's a big one. Uh, I want to be an organized person. I want to be able to uh, be ahead of the curve on things I'm getting done. Uh, and so I talk a lot about that. And that's sort of my story of uh, being organized for my credibility level. And then the last one I really hit on is financial fitness. Uh, that's a big piece of stress for everybody. Do I have enough money? How long am I going to live? When do I want to retire? And so um, I, I, I was on the board of uh, Junior Achievement for about 14 years, which is an organization that teaches kids about entrepreneurship and financial literacy. And it's obviously a big opportunity in the United States, people just learning how to live below their means. And, uh, you know, couples, that's a big source of stress for couples is financial. And uh, there's a way to manage that. There's a way to do it right, start early, learn how to invest, learn about 401ks and uh, individual retirement accounts. So once again, there's nothing magical about anything I'm talking about. It's just kind of hitting all the to do's and uh, you'll run into, you know, you'll run into a barriers, you'll run into roadblocks. But I think generally, the more you can get your, your, um, tell your own story and really realize who you want to be and how to do that, your, your, your effectiveness in dealing with others goes up dramatically. Yeah. So you talk about magic and you're from the magic kingdom and all that kind of stuff. It was interesting years ago, I was interviewing somebody for a, uh, I used to be in college student affairs. We were interviewing somebody for a resident director position. And he started talking about the magic of these interactions and how special and magical and, and, but when pressed for details about it, he never got beyond the magic. And as I think about this stuff, the magic happens behind the scene in the details and the preparation and the props and, the, and everything else. There's, to create magic, you have to step behind the scenes and be incredibly uh, detailed in order to get to the essence of that magic. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's you know, as they say, blood, sweat, and tears. And uh, it's, everything happens because... Uh, everyone believes in the mission, uh, you know, and, and I, I, I love the term. We, I, I talked to a lot of organizations. I, I ask them what their common purpose is. 
and they ask, they say to me, well, do you mean our mission? I said, no, no one knows what the mission is. I, I've never understood that. What well, do you mean our vision? I'm like, no, your vision. Why do people get up every morning and go to work in your company? What's their purpose? Because, uh, you know, the, the custodial cast member or the parking person, which was my job when I first started, you know, uh, becoming the most uh, admired company in the world, that's a great vision to have, but it really doesn't mean much to the parking attendant. But uh, if I'm, if as a parking attendant, I'm told every day through storytelling or any position at Disney, my common purpose, our common purpose is to make sure everyone has the best vacation they ever had and create magic for them. Uh, that's, that's giving me permission to go do a lot of stuff beyond parking cars. I can start dancing. I can start, uh, you know, talking to people. I can do all kinds of other things because my role is to park cars. My purpose is to create magic. And that's when you start talking about it that way, people are much, they feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. And when they come in, they don't just sweep the streets uh, at Magic Kingdom. They figure out how to do water art. You know, that's something we do there. They'll, they'll get, they'll paint with water and a broom and they'll paint Mickey Mouse or they'll paint a character or the bus drivers while they're driving, they'll sing, they'll do a sing-along. Uh, or So you're giving everyone permission to go above and beyond their role and do something that's bigger than themselves. And that is just, that unlocks so much potential in people. It kind of empowers them to be creative and it empowers them to sort of go beyond what they imagine they could do. Yeah. I, so when I go into a new organization, one of the first things I try and do is get all that language straight. What do you mean by mission? What do you mean by purpose? What do you mean by goal? What do you mean by objective? Because I come in so many places where the group itself, the leadership team itself doesn't even agree on what those, that terminology is. How important right. is shared language to creating a powerful organization? Oh my gosh. It is, I mean, it is, it's, it's the, it's the blueprint for how you get work done. Every company has its own culture, its own language and ones that don't uh, it's, there's could be a lot of confusion. Everything's already confusing without having to just not, you know, be specific about what you mean. And ironically, I'm uh, doing executive coaching for a couple of uh, people who had approached me and we were talking about this. I said, well, what are the values of your organization and what are the behaviors that have been created so far? I want to understand that before we go any further. So he went and talked to his, um, his uh, boss about it. His boss gave him a, a, a piece of paper that had a lot of this laid out. And he, when he called me, he said, I've never seen this. And I worked for this organization for like 10 years. And he, he showed it to some of their, his, his co-executives. They've never seen it either. But apparently this was the vision of their, their CEO and so just, you know, it just, it's almost like too, too unbelievable to be true that you could have the CEO knows what the mission is and no one else does. And so that common language, um, I'm not a big fan of buzzwords. Say what you mean. Don't, you know, sometimes we just try to come up with new term terminology for things. Just don't try to impress people with, you know, really fancy terminology. Tell them what you mean, make it simple. And when it's simple, people can execute the plan because it really is simple. It's, it's, uh, I like to say, all this is simple and it really is not easy. So that there's a, yeah. there's a, a difference there and um, common language. Yeah. You just, uh, and I think that you can, it's, I look at it kind of like raising your kids, right? You can tell them something a thousand times and right when you are sick and tired of saying the same thing over and over again, they're just starting to understand. And I think that's what happens in organizations. We just, uh, we don't stick with the basics. We don't st stick with the basic storytelling every day talking about why we're there because we get bored with it. We get, you know, we want to go to the new shiny object and that just causes more confusion and more, less focus. Yeah. It's the, and it, like I've been banging the drum for on simplicity for a while and it caused me to dive in. And one of the things that I see around simplicity is from whether you're talking essentialism or you're talking about Marie Kondo or whatever, is that, uh, simplicity means that action comes after you've essentialized. You need to let it get messy first. You know, Marie Kondo takes everything out of the closet and piles it on the bed. Essentialism talks about how you've got to do all the work beforehand in order to find what is essential. And that to me is people want it simplistic. And that means they'll take what's dumbed down, but they're not willing to go through the complexity to find out what's essential and make it simple. Uh, right. And it's hard right. work. That's the hard work about around. It's simple, 
but it's really hard because you've got to you've got to account for all the complexity that's out there. Sure, uh, it's on simplicity is on the other side of complexity. Yeah, it's um and the world is a complex place, absolutely, and it, there's a lot of ambiguity. And it's, you know, it's confusing. It's not always easy to know what you're supposed to do, but there are parts of your organization that you, and parts of your personal life that you can simplify. And a lot of times we like, somehow we just like to make things more, um, I guess more complex because it feels like we're being smarter or we're, we're adding value and, uh, things will get complex on their own. I don't think we need to help it along quick, a quick story. Uh, um, uh, Bodenheimer used to be the CEO, the head of uh, ESPN. And uh, he was the CEO there when Disney bought ABC and Cap Capital City back way back in the day. And he was there for like 25 years. And um, one day uh, he came and spoke at Disney and he told a story and he said, uh, people said, well, what's, how do you decide what your priorities are at ESPN? He said, well, I'll tell you a story I, about a reporter asked me the same question. And he said, I, I showed him a little piece of plastic I had. We all carry around ESPN and on our keychains, and it's a little piece of plastic and it lists what our priorities are for the year. Every year we decide what the top three or four priorities are going to be. And we put them on this little card and then we all know what they are. And we remind them ourselves of that every day. So during the year we work towards the goals we decided on. And the reporter said, well, can you tell me more about that? He said, yeah, every year we come up with three or four goals. We put them on this card and we remind ourselves every day to do these things. The reporter wanted to know more. He said, look, there is no more. That's what it is. That's what we do. And that's how we do it. And that's the beauty of simplicity. And why most CEOs would like to get really flowery and come up with a whole new way. He, he refused to do that. He just went back. This is our system. This is how it works. And it works well. Yeah. And there's a, there's the, the concept of priorities, uh, priorities was never plural until the early 1900s. It was, you had a priority. That was it. So nobody right. invent until they started getting into organizational psychology and organizational systems. That's when they invented a plural of priorities. So it was always, you had one priority. Otherwise, you know, when you walk into an organization as a consultant, sometimes they'll lay down a, a list of 10, 15, 20 priorities for the year. And that's impossible to manage. Yep. Yeah. And ironically, what I found running a business was usually if you pick the right one or two, they address the other 18. Exactly. And so you just have to have faith that that's all going to play through. Yeah. And that's the, that's the beauty of essentialism is that in answering one question, you've answered the rest. Right. Yeah. Right. So tell me, like you started off in your career at Disney at a, in a college program and Disney's known for its amazing uh, training programs. How important is leadership development, uh, organized programs for leadership development? How important that is that to an organization? Yeah, I think it's important, but I think it's a lot less important than people think. Uh, what I what I found is most of what I learned at um, and, and from experience at working technically from a leadership standpoint uh, is through doing. It's through going through experiences, interacting with people, uh, being tested, succeeding, failing, uh, having to be self aware, uh, having to go. Th home some nights and lick my wounds about the bad decision I made and learn from that moving forward. I think there's a place for leadership development. Uh, I think there's two places for it. One is, um, you know, individuals who are highly talented, they want to know they're on a path. They want to know that they're, they're making progress and they're, uh, they're learning constantly. So that's not necessarily a class to go to, but I think leaders with their high potential people have to make sure that they are having regular conversations with people. What do you want to learn next? Next year, what's the next piece you want to learn? And, and put that responsibility on people, have them go educate themselves. Um, because a lot of times, they'll, they'll, you know, we always say we don't have time to do it. Well, someone comes to me and says, I want to improve my, uh, my business savvy. All right, well, let's, let's go and find an executive MBA program and I'll send you for a week. And so I don't have to do anything except pay for it, right? And I'm going to get you that experience. Um, and we're going to decide together what exposure we're going to give them and how we're going to, the experiences we're going to put them in, what projects we're going to put them on. Um, but I think a lot of it, you have to work it into your day to day. You just can't wait for the two day leadership conference once a year and say, okay, we're going to develop ourselves for the next two days and then we'll go back to work. I think it has to be folded into what you do every day, feedback, conversations about how you're getting work done. 
And then there is a time and place for the, the leadership conference. It's nice to go away and get away from the daily grind and spend time as a team or, or travel for a couple of days and go be able to think about what you're getting done. I always blocked or I had my assistant block when I was at Disney. She would block a, one day a month and it would just be Dan's day. And it was during the week. And that, that day would arrive in the middle of all the chaos and you know, all the stuff that goes on there. And she said, I, you know, okay, what do I have going on this week? She goes, well, this day you have this, you have this. And on Thursday, you have Dan's day. I was like, yes. It's like a two-week Hawaiian vacation. You, know, you have one day to say, I can go to Starbucks. I can go dress up as a guest and go just out in the park for the day and bring my laptop and work and observe. I can go off property, just go think. And uh, I learned myself, and that wasn't something my boss told me to do or anyone told me to do, but I, 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 I wanted self-development. And so recapping, A, your daily experiences is where you can get the most development. And if people say, well, I'm not learning anything, I'd say, well, that's, you're not thinking about things the right way. Because you can be learning something every single day. If you observe, you're curious about people, you ask questions, uh, your environment you can learn in. Uh, the conferences are a great way to disconnect, and then you can create your own you know, your own mini retreat with yourself to go think about how you're getting work done, how you're kind of working with your family, how you're getting things, what your goals are. And uh, I think once a month, it's a great breakaway, even if you're, it's for a few hours in an afternoon. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but there's a person who's been with an organization for 10 years, and you're supposed to determine whether they have 10 years worth of experience or one year's experience 10 times. How do you help that person get something out of each day, each year's experience, how do you turn experience into that development opportunity? Yeah, well, I think it's uh, the way you look at your role. And it comes back to how I think about, um, uh, you know, the book that I've written, uh, the working title right now is How's the Weather in Your Kingdom? So what I, what I tell leaders is your job, your main job isn't doing, your main job is creating an environment for your people to do. And so if you, if you focus on that, don't go, when you go in every day, don't have a checklist of 20 things to run after. Delegate as many of those items as you can. Get organized of how to get those off your list so you can take a step back and create an environment for people to work in and rate, get, above the, get above the fray. And when you do that, you can have those great conversations with people. You can say, um, I used to do that with my team. When I had a new leader for the first six months, I'd say, I want an update every week. And I'd like to know what you're working on. But most importantly, I want to know what you learned this week. And when you put people accountable that way, they start to figure that out. Like, okay, what did I learn? Let me, let me really th think and process this. And they'd come back and they'd say, you know what? I'd, when I first started doing this, I'd start writing. I'm like, I didn't learn anything. But when you, I had to think about it, I realized, well, yeah, I interacted with a cast member who'd worked here for 25 years and I took this approach and it really didn't work because they've seen 50 managers come through here. And so I learned how to approach high senior cast and really get value out of that and respect them and have them do the talking. That was one learning. Or I had someone say, you know, this week I learned how the receiving process works. You know, we have uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of product go through the Magic Kingdom food and beverage. I want people to know how that system works. So some of this is technical, some of it is leadership driven. But uh, I think as a leader, um, in, in, instead of trying to develop people all the time, just ask them every week, I want you to be learning something new. And I want you to tell me what that is. And uh, it's interesting that you, I, I don't know, I may be putting thoughts in your brain. So stop me if I am, but it sounds like <laughs> your challenge or what you're, what you're saying is, was my challenge when I was running a leadership development program in a large organization, most of the people in the field and the leaders wanted that silver bullet of a a week long leadership development conference that transitions them into supervisors or managers or directors. And then the assumption was they'd go back fixed and be able to perform. So my job was trying to figure out how do I create a foundation through those programs that they would go back and continuously learn. And that needed to involve their leadership to, to encourage them to verbalize. This is what I'm learning. Yeah. I got some language. I got some thoughts. But ultimately, it needs to work in the real world. And the learning really happens after the class. Absolutely. Because, um, I mean, you're interacting with hundreds of people every day. You're problem solving every day. You're having to be creative every day. You're having to overcome obstacles and barriers every day. 
And if you take a step back and have people think about how they're doing that, they'll realize and they'll start to understand how their mind works. And that's where development happens. I think uh, T.S. Eliot, I think it was, who said that we had the experience, but we missed the meaning. And when you leave meaning on the floor, man, that's where the, the treasures are. Um, yep. So that's, I, I actually, I, I wrote a couple of books on using experience on purpose to, to teach and to develop people. And that was the hardest thing to get across is that it's not about the, when you're getting the information, it's not about the information. It's about applying things and then reflecting on that. That's where the learning happens. Yeah, this ties a little bit. All these things overlap, but uh, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the book uh, Mindset by uh, Carol Dweck. And uh, she talks about there's growth mindsets and fixed mindsets. And, you know, growth mindset says, let me get really good at something and let me do it over and over every day and feel good about myself. A growth mindset is let me good, get good at things and then let me go try and become a novice at other things. And over time, get better and better until I become an expert in those things. And then let me go try. And so almost if you can always be in this novice mode and open mind that you're trying to learn new things, um, you feel it's you have to get comfortable with it because when you're a novice, you're vulnerable. and It's not comfortable. But if you can say, you know what, I'm not here. I'm a novice. I, I'm not supposed to do good with this, but I'm learning right now. And if I don't start learning, I'll never get good at it. Yeah. And uh, it's a it's a different mindset uh, of how to approach that. And some people don't like that. But some people want to just be doing well at everything all the time. And they get stuck in this little, you know, they get pigeonholed because they don't want to try anything new because they don't want to look like they're not good at something. And yeah, they only want to do things they're already good at. And so when I was working with uh, uh, I training master coaches for an organization, we would we would say, you know what, experts walk in the room to look at things that will confirm their expertise. Beginners walk in the room and will see things that they never saw before because they don't assume they know everything. Right. And, and so one of the biggest, like uh, w the way that we would create master coaches, it wasn't about taking a high stakes test. That was part of making sure they knew the, knew their stuff. It wasn't just observing their skills and interacting with people. I knew somebody was ready to be called a master. As soon as they walked into me and said, man, this area is huge. I've got so much more that I need to learn. And that told me that they had that master, the master mindset we were looking at, which was the, the, you've heard the adage that when the learner is ready, the master will appear. Well, yeah. the master knows when to appear with what, and it's not everything. Um, they just, right. they just right. know what's next yeah. for that student. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. And it's, uh, it, it can take a lifetime to learn that. And I think, you know, our, I think kids learn that over time. That's how um, people become, they mature over time when you realize you don't know everything. So tell me this, just real practical stuff. What do you do on an ongoing basis? This is from one of my Facebook friends who is also a organizational development specialist. She asked, what do you do on an ongoing basis to continually develop your leadership skills? How do you keep that growth mindset? How do you keep that beginner's attitude? Yeah, well, um, I, I guess a good example is as I, there's certain topics that I know are really important and I, I continue to dive deeper and deeper and deeper into them. Uh, so emotional intelligence is a good example. I know that's important. And I know that I knew that at Disney without even knowing what it was, but I know that the idea of how to interact with people and through people is, is that's one of the definitions of leadership. And so when I did a presentation recently, they wanted a deep dive on emotional intelligence only. They didn't want to hear anything else I had to talk about. So I really had to educate myself and dive to the next level and find out for myself. You know, they always talk about if you really want to learn a topic, present it. And so yeah. I had to have a point of view. And so I looked at the definition of it. I broke it down. I read articles. I read a couple books. I watched some TEDx's and just pulled together all the points of view that are out there. And then I told the story through my own experiences. And um, so that, that's, that's a big piece of kind of how I continue to learn. Uh, I will, um, I'm subscribed to all kinds of articles. Uh, every day I have stuff flown in my in email box and I, you know, I kind of read bits and pieces here and there. Um, and then I think there's probably just, as I've learned in my career, just getting exposure to new things. Uh, one of the big goals my wife and I have is to get as many um, opportunities working in my new company outside the United States. 
And uh, cause every time I go somewhere, boy, it's, you're in a major learning mode when you go to another country. So, you know, I'm going to Brazil next week. I don't speak Portuguese and I've, I've been there once already, but I'm learning the culture. I'm learning the style. I'm learning how, what they're interested in hearing about. I'm having to learn how to give my speeches in half the speed at which I talk because there's usually a, an interpreter there, which has been, a, and it's actually helped a lot. My speeches are so much better when I have to go through an interpreter because I, you know, I have much less of a budget of words to use. So I select them very carefully. And so I've learned a lot from that. Um, going to Croatia and doing uh, consulting there. Once again, when you go to these new other countries and you're not just visiting, you actually have to interact with people and create value. It really makes you open your mind up to make sure you're doing that. And you have to learn a lot about how they receive information, their attitudes towards things, uh, their, their culture. So in short, what you're saying is if you want to continuously develop your leadership skills, continue to put yourself in novel and new situations. Absolutely. So who, tell me this, who was your mentor as you went through? Was it uh, a, a series of mentors? Did you have one for a long time? Were they a personal relationship? Was it a, uh, uh, someone from history. Tell me about your mentor experience. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Also, I have, um, you know, I've had some people, um, key in my life who have helped me, um, kind of become self-aware and give me advice. Uh, my, uh, my parents, um, my wife, uh, you know, people around me who are willing to kind of weigh in on how I'm thinking about things. And then the other side of that is I've learned over time. I never had, if someone said, you know, you always hear the whole story. Well, when I worked back 20 years ago, there was so-and-so and, you know, he told me all the secrets of life and that's changed everything. I didn't have that person. I had a lot of those different people. And what I've found is um, anyone can be a mentor. And there's some people I connected with. Um, I've had cast members who worked at Disney who mentored me because I'd go talk to them about, hey, if you were in a vice president role, what would you be focused on? I've had peers mentor me. Um, I've had uh, my, my direct reports have mentored me. I've had a couple bosses that have been, been great mentors. Um, I think everyone has something different to offer. And as long as you're open-minded, you can get a lot of pieces and parts from them and you can get counsel from a lot of different people. Um, I get calls, you know, pretty frequently on advice, career advice, uh, or someone's thinking about leaving a company or th someone's thinking about taking a promotion or not taking a promotion. And the advice I always give them is, thanks for calling me. I'm going to tell you what I think. And you need to call 10 more people. And they're going to tell you probably the opposite of what I'm telling you. And at the end of the day, you're going to have to decide what you're going to do because there's only one person. It's you who makes decisions in your life. And leave it there. So I think when people ask us advice, we always like to think we have the right answer. We really don't. We just have a point of view. And that's how, kind of how I've selected my mentors through time. Yeah, it sounds like a little bit of the Emerson approach to Emerson said the true scholar is the one who can find what somebody else has to teach them um, right in, in every right. other person uh, I, I'm getting into some just kind of skipping around the different questions here um, sure. tell me this how important is casting a vision and I think you've touched this a little bit how important is casting a vision to the personal growth of your people of your employees so I, I so I guess is it how important is it to make sure your team knows it's a, your priority that they grow? Uh, well, I think it's, what, I'm, I'm taking this from the internet and it's, uh, I think it's about um, uh, not that you're casting a vision for their growth, but casting a vision for the organization. I think it gets into this purpose statement piece. How yeah. important is that in linking that to why, how people, how you're like their growth as, as an employee, how, how important is it that they know uh, this place is going someplace? Yeah, it's, um, it's when, when people, once again, I think we were talking about storytelling earlier, when people have an emotional connection to what they do all the time, and they know it just goes beyond a, a paycheck or a role, and they know how they connect to the bigger picture of the organization, uh, that's just, they're more engaged. It's more personal for them, and they're more likely to be, uh, have a a better attitude towards it to, to you're able to get the uh, discretionary effort out of them because they're going to choose to do more because they feel valued. They feel respected. Uh, we always talk about if you want people to act like professionals, you got to treat them like professionals. And if you don't do that, they're going to, they, they will rise the expectation you set for them. 
And if you said it at you're just supposed to do this job and that's what we're paying you for, then they'll do that. But if you make it bigger and show them the time of day and the respect and get to know them personally and make sure and tell stories about why their, their behaviors are just impacting the success of the organization, human nature will say they'll get much more engaged. It's not a, it's not a hundred percent of people, but human nature says most people like to be, they like to know they're making a difference. They like to be, uh, know that they're important. And, um, it's hard to do, you know, we have 74,000 cast members at Disney and the, the goal is every single cast member personally knows how much they matter and they're, they, and we tell them how much they matter every day. And it's a, it's a, it's a tall, it's a tall order to be able to do that. But if you really want to get to the maximum optimization and the best service levels and the best organization, you have to focus on that. Yeah. So I heard a story about a hospital that, it really didn't matter what they had printed on their vision brochure or their purpose or, but when you ask the housekeeping, what their role was, the ones who said that my role is to clean rooms, very limited engagement. Um, they did their job, but that was about it. But when you ask the, the ones who said, my job is just like the doctors, which is to get people well and get people home, man, they were engaged and they went the extra mile in cleaning the room. And it was that purpose beyond themselves it's not just a job. There's, some, there's a big why that we're here. Right. We were, um, there's the movie, uh, I think a lot of maybe the viewers have seen is uh, Hidden Figures. It's about the space program and uh, a gentleman. And it, it, you know, the movie deals with the space program, but it also deals with a lot of the uh, racial issues back at that time. And there's a, uh, one of the scientists comes in to, uh, to NASA and there's a guy in the hallway sweeping and he says, you know, he asks him, you know, what are you doing here? And he says, what's your, what's your job? He said, my job is to help put a man on the moon. And that, you know, he's sweeping the floor, but he knew that he was part of a bigger picture to work towards that. And whoever, you know, set him up for that and talk, people just don't make that up. That is what, that's where you start to get people motivated and you get people connected to the, the bigger purpose. It's not they're just their job. It's the purpose, which is kind of exciting. So just the last couple of questions here and uh, just your first thoughts. So when I ask you, who's your hero? What's your response? Oh boy. I, you know, I don't, I don't have one specific person in mind, but I think uh, this idea of people who get up every morning and make the best of what they have is for me, that's, that's what a, that's what a hero looks like. Uh, I just, you know, my wife and I've traveled all through the world and, you know, I, I guess this is in the United States, we have a lot, you know, we have a lot of a, a, a level of uh, comfort, a level of security. I think we kind of take for granted and we've been all over the world and that doesn't connect to happiness. We've been places where people have nothing and they get up every day and they make the best and most of what they have and they're grateful for it. And for me, that's what uh, I think that's, that's, I aspire to kind of be like that. Yeah, I need to reveal something here. I, I do like Jimmy Buffett. He has a great song called It's My Job, where he contrasts the guy up on stage versus the guy cleaning the stage and which one's happier. Oh, that's great. I got to listen to that because I'm uh, actually I was running yesterday. I, I, I have all the greatest hits, but I'm not a, an aficionado. So I have to go to that second tier of songs and listen to that one. His best stuff is on the second and third tier, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell me this. What author do you find yourself quoting most? Um, as I mentioned before, I'm a big fan of, uh, um, like Carol Dweck with the mindset, uh, Stephen Covey has some really great, simple common sense concepts. I find myself talking about a lot between, you know, um, uh, this, these emotional bank accounts and that idea of there's a give and take between people every day. And then, um, I actually have three or four books of just quotes. A lot of them are, um, um, uh, former presidents. Uh, and, uh, I, I don't have one person I quote often, but I'm a big fan of quotes. And I think they're, they're a real good way to set up, you know, to capture a really complex concept into one thing. When you're teaching, you set it up that way and then can dive into it after. Yeah. To me, quotes play the same role as storytelling, except for that you have really, uh, amazingly talented person putting lots of meaning into a few words. So that's, yeah. I use quotes the same way I use stories. Yeah. I have a one, there's one quote that uh, I, I, I um, 
find myself thinking about a lot. My grandfather uh, was um, in World War II. He went to U.S. Naval Academy, and he was in the, the three-year class, class of 42. He was on the Columbia during the war and was a naval architect afterwards, so really impressive guy. And uh, one of the quotes he had I've taken forward, and I've shared this um, I almost say it ad nauseum with people because I love it so much is, you know, you do your best and then you forgive yourself. And that was one of his quotes. And uh, everyone hears it a little bit differently, but um, I love that concept is you can, you know, did you do your best today? And um, no matter how well you did, are you willing to forgive yourself and start over tomorrow and do better tomorrow? That's good stuff. What, um, what book do you find yourself giving people the most? What's your favorite book to gift? Um, coming back to the seven habits of highly effective people is something that I, I, you know, like to share with people. Um, and, um, there's, oh, um, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's probably the one. I, I think that has been timeless. I, I, th- I don't know how long it was written 25, 30 years ago, but it's, uh, it's held up over time. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me this, how can people, I think there's a lot of stuff that people will grab from our conversation today where they may want to follow up with you. How can people get in contact with you uh, about your offerings as a consultant, a coach, and a speaker? Sure. Um, If they go to my website, it's uh, dancockrell.com. And on there, I have, uh, if if they'd like to sign up for my article of the week, um, about 20 years ago, uh, I started to uh, collect articles and I'd send them out to my, my leadership team every week. And I did that for 18 years. When I left Disney, I continued that. So I curate articles, I think, that are insightful or helpful. And those go out every Friday morning. So if people want to sign up for that. It's free. And they just go on my website, put their email address in, and they'll, they'll receive that daily or weekly. Um, also, um, uh, my, my, uh, they can send me emails to that site. And uh, my cell phone number is on there. So if people are curious about... Um, anything they have in mind, they can go there and look it up. And I find myself, a lot of the topics I talk on there, like I said, like today, a lot of them overlap. They're, they're, they relate to each other. Um, but um, I find myself customizing everything. I can do a, I've done a, a 30 minute speech. I can do a 90 minute speech. I can do a four hour and eight hour leadership workshop. I, I just find myself kind of toggling in and out that the hardest thing I've done is a 30 minute keynote speech. I said, give me three hours, but 30 minutes, boy, that's tough to try to get something meaningful in that short of time period. It's a good test. Yeah. I, so I did a three day executive program on uh, um, emotional intelligence and then an uh, executive went through that and said, Hey, I've got a conference coming up. Can you do that same thing for me in 45 minutes? Yeah. And I'm sure you've never experienced that, but it's, it was, it's a great challenge. But what it caused me to do is like what you said, if you want to learn something, present it. If you really want to get deep into something, present it in a short time frame. Because uh, right. it forced me to get it down to what is, what am I really talking about here? So, the essentials. Yeah. Well, I, you keep bringing up quotes. Thomas Jefferson, I think it was, said something along the lines of, you know, I, I'm sorry that this letter is so long. If I had more time, it'd be much more concise. You know, yeah. just, yep. it's easy to, it's easy to make things long. It's hard to make them short. Yeah. That's why, like, I, I think we're, you know, a good hour into this and I think we're just scratching the surface. Yeah. I would love to spend more time just exploring specifics around managing self, managing others and managing uh, uh, organizations, leading organizations. That, that format is the same format kind of that I use in creating uh, professional development programs. I, I mo- I've moved away from talking about leadership because all these things that, you, that you're talking about, uh, individual contributors need to know as well. If they want to be valuable to the organization, they need to know all that as well. And yet Absolutely. oftentimes if it's labored, uh, labeled leadership, uh, they'll steer away from it because they don't want to be in management. They don't want to, because people equate those things. But right. man, that's those are three powerful uh, themes to explore when it comes to uh, just being a valued professional, a valued person. So, so much yep. more to talk about. And yet, I know that we both have things to move on to today. I really appreciate the fact that you took this time with me today and how much uh, effort was put into just us connecting. Thank you so much, Dan. Thanks, John. Really enjoyed it. <laughs>